I'm going to do a little bit different on our background. Um, and I have to be honest with you, thanks to AI, um, I was delving into Genesis quite a bit. And it, it's amazing how it can figure statistically how things have transpired. For example, there's 25 generations in the book of Genesis. And uh, all the scholars that I've read said it was like 1900 and something years to 2000 years. Well, AI said it's 2188 years. Uh, and that the average age of each generation is 87. And now we know that some of the folks live longer than that, but when you did the medium average, it was that. But uh, 4000 BC was, uh, by what scholars say, was uh, the garden creation, Adam and Eve. 1500 years later was uh, the flood. And 2067 BC was Abraham. 2016, Joseph is born to Rachel. Uh, 1898, Joseph is sold to the Israelites or Ishmaelites. Uh, 1887 BC, he dreams of the cupbearer and the baker. Uh, 1886 BC, uh, Pharaoh's dreams. And then here we are in 1875 BC. 2,000 years later, the book of Genesis. We've just traveled 2,000 years. Uh, and when we grasp that, uh, that it's just amazing. And think with me here. We don't have the law yet. Moses hasn't been born yet. Uh, matter of fact, 400 years later, when we in the book of Genesis, when we step into the Exodus, the book of Exodus, that's 400 years that span. Um, and then, I don't know if there's, a, if there's a relationship to it, but okay, from the fall <coughs> to the deliverance, 400 years. To the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, to the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, 400 years. Now, is there, uh, is that pertinent? No, but it, I think it's more than a coincidence. And what it does show, you know, the, the Bible tells us that the day in the sight of the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So when we go through, right now, we're, we're in two days of God's sight. But what really uh, is amazing to me, and, uh, you know, there's archaeologists and historians, no, nothing has been scrutinized and studied more than the Bible. Nothing. Nothing is nothing's even close. And the more we study it, the more we look into it, the more it verifies itself. From the oldest documents to the earliest to the latest documents, they're almost identical. The, the Dead Sea Scrolls is a perfect example of that. But what we need to understand here, this, this 2,000 years is a verbal tradition. Parents passing on to their children, to their children, to their children, to their children. And that is, I believe, the preservation of God, making sure that it is passed on accurately. Uh, so here we are, 2,000 years after creation, and Joseph is getting his comeuppance. I mean, the boys are getting their comeuppance. <laughs> Joseph. So. All right, we're going to, today we're going to be in Genesis chapter 42. We're going to look at verses 1 through 28. And it reads as such. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you just keep looking at each other? He continued, I heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us so that we may live and not die. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. 
but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, You are spies. You've come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. Your servants were twelve brothers, son of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. Joseph said to them, It's just as I told you, you are spies, and this is how you'll be tested. Send one of your number to get your brother. Do this, and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, bring your youngest brother to me. They said to one another, Surely we're being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them, since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep, but then came back and spoke to them. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back in, its, in his sack. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to, to get feed for his donkey, and he saw the silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has returned, he said to his brothers. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other trembling and said, What is this that God has done to us? You just got to love the story. Mm -hmm. uh, but then sometimes what we fail to do <clears throat> is see the trauma of, of it. So, uh, good. Thank you, Bob. Uh, point number one. Were Jacob's brothers slothful? Uh, when Jacob, uh, Jacob's sons, I'm sorry, slothful. When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you stand there looking at each other? He continued, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there, buy some for us, so that we may live and not die. Uh, so often in the scriptures, you know, especially those of us uh, that maybe have been around a little longer than some other folks, there are sayings in the Bible that we've adopted and taken for ourselves. This one, I can hear my mother say, why are you guys just standing there looking at each other? Go cut the grass. Uh, how about the, get your hands out of your pockets and go, go do something. Well, that intrigued me, so I, I uh, started doing a little research of the sayings and uh, euphemisms and metaphors and things in the Bible that we've adopted and probably many people don't know their biblical sayings. Let me just share some of them with you. The blind leading the blind. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that came from Matthew 15. Uh, these are, at, I'm not going to show the references. I have them. Yeah. But uh, it's just a drop in the bucket from Isaiah. Uh, hey, the writing's on the wall. Mm -hmm. Daniel. Uh, he, boy, he escaped, how about this one? By the skin of his teeth. Uh, I have escaped only by the skin of my teeth. Joe. <laughs> uh, uh, a labor of love. Ah, oh, it's just a labor of love. Well, uh, First Thessalonians, remember, without ceasing your what? Work of faith and your labor of love. Uh, go the extra mile. You know, with the centurions and Jesus. If they, if they want to go a mile, go, go, go two miles. A thorn in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Apostle Paul. Uh, hey, cast the first stone. You are the you, know, you cast the first stone. Mm -hmm. The woman taken in adultery. Salt of the earth. Uh, boy, I've heard that so often. Wolves in sheep's clothing. And then there's some other just random ones that I didn't do uh, references to. Scapegoat. Mm -hmm. Don't be the scapegoat. Uh, 
a man after my own heart. Uh, don't, put, don't put words in my mouth. Feet of clay. Bite the dust. A fly in the ointment, a drop in the bucket. Uh, just, there, there's, there's so many. Uh, and I, I thought about this. So many sayings that we've had traditionally over the years have been biblically based. A lot of things that I just said right now, my, my grandchildren would just look at me. Not because these sayings aren't used anymore. It's because we've lost the, the Bible as the foundation of our language. I'm a, uh, I consider myself somewhat of a wordsmith. Uh, not, uh, not a very good one, but I, I love words. <laughs> and one of my favorite books that I have is I have both editions of Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary of the English language. I'll give you a hundred dollars for every word in that dictionary that is not biblically based if you give me a dollar for every one that is. Our foundation was based on the scriptures of our language, the English language that we have. Uh, really, Webster <coughs> just continued with use. I, I don't mean alluding to scripture, just flat out scripture references to the proper use of, of the word. And one of the, uh, uh, my go-to scriptures so often, uh, Psalm 11 verse 3, and you'll hear me say it often, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? If we lose our language, what are we going to do? If we mutilate or change the meanings of words, what are we going to do? Uh, and so when we, I, I've taken a great liberty here, forgive me for that, asking the question, were the boys slothful? Uh, you know, why do you stand there looking at each other? Let, let's go. And, uh, and I think that is a legitimate question. Were they slothful? You know, were they just standing, you know, these are, they weren't kids. You know, the youngest, uh, Benjamin, uh, Joseph here is in his 20s. So, you know, uh, the older brothers uh, should have been playing more. So, anyway, I'm done. Uh, I venture to say that Webster would probably turn over his grave if you looked at some of the words mm -hmm. that are in there in the newer versions of the Webster. Right. It, it's not only that, it's the total mutilation of words that we have there. Marriage. The word marriage. I mean, our, when, when our Supreme Court, I mean, they're the ones who would to say and define what the law is and the foundation of the law, and it's based on our Constitution. When they redefine marriage, it could be between a man and a man, a woman and a woman. Uh, that's like saying uh, up is down. Yeah, you can call it, if you want to descend, you can call it up. Now, as much as I am opposed to same sex relations, if you were to approve that, okay, don't call it marriage. You know, call it happy reunion, or happy union, or unhappy union, or I could think of some other things I can't say. Okay, but yeah. It, it is amazing when, when, when you read through some of the founding fathers' words, how much they realized the importance of keeping the Bible at the center of everything that we do. And the teachings in the Bible, and, and, and see where we're at now, we kind of understand why. Let me. Uh, um, I serve one up for you there. Yeah, I got. I, this is one of the two eighties that will be coming out next week. Mm -hmm. 
when reading the Bible, the Apostolic Fathers, or even classic literature, here's what I've observed. Literarily, in our vocabulary, in our writing, in our insight, in our understanding, we have become ignorant. And I said, I myself, the most ignorant. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hosea 4.6. Uh, I don't read very many modern books, uh, and the reason being is um, the thinking of the ancients, I'll use that word, unbelievable. I'm, I'm, I'm reading uh, Paradise Lost. John Milton just, anyway, he, 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 has, he has words that uh, uh, Alexa doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> we may never get off point one, but just one of the things that we're going to be studying starting tomorrow night in our men's group is, is uh, from Deuteronomy 6, and Mark has been talking about that through his recent study. And, you know, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And in the Shema, the, the Jewish um, translation of that, it was it was so important. And you read all the way through Deuteronomy 6 where it, where it tells us and instructs us as parents, as fathers, to teach our children, you know, from the time we get up till the time we go to bed, all these things. And we have lost that. Mm -hmm. tremendously and that's why this generation is where it's at now because we haven't done that and I'm guilty myself at times of not doing that with my kids and my grandkids but but it's so important and and to start to get back to the beginning that's where we're going to start tomorrow with our with our study of discipleship that's where we got to go that's the beginning of the wisdom and that's the beginning of how we're going to turn this thing around we really we have to look back and, and see that and and and, and and confess where we've fallen short and, and take up the mantle and say that we have to make an impact in the lives of the ones that we can affect, which are in our families, starting. So anyway, sorry, I keep on my soapbox. Um, number two, was Joseph wise in his deceit? So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Now, picture Joseph. He's changed quite a bit since his brothers have seen him last. Mm -hmm. You know, he's virtually unrecognizable, if you think about it. He's beardless. He's clean-shaven. He, he, he's got the dress of, you know, Egyptian nobility on. Uh, he's speaking in the Egyptian language. He's speaking to his brothers through an interpreter. He became pretty shrewd here in this whole situation. He he concealed his identity, and it was some maybe level of, of deceit, but it, but it wasn't. He wasn't being necessarily forthright. He spoke really very harshly to his brothers, and he accused them of being spies. And and he took advantage of this power to deal with his brothers, who had last time he saw them um, had treated him pretty badly when they sold him into slavery. Um, his methods verged on deception. He, he withheld critical information. He manipulated the events in various ways. And he acted in a way as a detective, conducting a tough interrogation of these guys. You know, what are you doing here? You're you trying to spy on our land? Um, but <laughs> realistically, he really couldn't proceed, proceed with this um, if he didn't and get the information he wanted from them if he, if he didn't show some degree of shrewdness. Um, and you can use shrewdness in a good way or, or an ill way. The Hebrew word for shrewdness is translated as good judgment, prudence, and clever. And it, it indicates it might take foresight and skill to make godly work possible in difficult situations. And Jesus himself um, counseled his disciples to be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. The Bible commends shrewdness in the pursuit of noble purposes. 
Joseph himself didn't gain anything from these actions. He, he received a blessing from God, he, and his service was going to be a blessing to, to others, including his brothers. He could have exploited his brothers. He had them in a real desperate predicament here. And he could have asked for, you know, double the price of the grain, whatever he wanted to do. He could have kept them all in prison, but he didn't. He could have done anything, but he used his knowledge to actually save his brothers. And we, we read in uh, Psalm 32, 2, where it says, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. David, in his prior life, um, was over now, and he was a repentant and forgiven sinner. And he didn't need the deceit to cover his ways. And Spurgeon says, you must all have noticed in David's case that he had fallen into this foul sin with Bathsheba. He, he ceased to exist that transparent, truth-speaking character which had charmed us so much more, the one that had a heart after God. The lesson from the whole is this, be honest. Sinner, may God, may God make you honest. Do not deceive yourself. Make a clean case of it before God. Have an honest religion or have none at all. Have a religion of the heart or else not. Put aside the mere vestment, the garment of piety, and let your soul be right. Be honest. And that's that's the case. But David did use this, um, and he, I think he was very wise in the way he used this whole situation to, to his advantage and ultimately to his brothers and his father's Joseph. advantage. Joseph. Yes. Yeah. He said that. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just, I, when we chose the word, was he wise in his deceit? That sounds like you can't put wisdom and deceit together. Um, but the uh, the text is through his serpents, but gentle as doves. I think that fits here a, a little bit. And uh, you remember when Solomon, when the two women, they, one of them uh, crushed her baby, and mm -hmm. they were, he had to decide which baby. He said, well, take the baby, cut it in half. Well, that was deceitful. He was deceiving them wisely to get the truth out. So maybe uh, deceit isn't the best word, but I don't know if one any better. Do you think so? Truth. Yeah. Truth. Pardon? Truth. Well, yeah, was it wise in, in his... Maybe truth was better than... Shrewdness? Yeah. yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, that was a better one. Okay, number three. I, I Forgive me, but I couldn't help myself. Did Joseph have an aha moment? A H A. An aha moment. Uh, <clears throat> although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, Dear spies, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. Uh, the word uh, spies that's used there in the Septuagint is explorers. It softens it quite a bit. So you're explorers. You've come to explore the, the country. Uh, and he said, and then, you know, he, he remembered his dream. What was the dream? Listen to this dream in Genesis 37. We are binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose up, stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. I had another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, the eleven stars, those, you know, ten of them were standing before him, were bowing down to me. Uh, this is probably ten or twelve years later, I'm going to imagine, since his brother sold them. And Judah I, it indicates that he thought he was dead. You know, uh, later on when we read the text, it sounds like like he, like he was dead. And so he, this memory, this aha moment comes. I dream. I remember my dream. 
-hmm. And then you think about that dream. That, and listen, I'm sure Joseph remembered that dream. Because that's what turned us around. They hated him yeah. because of these dreams. And here they are. What are they, what are they after? Wheat. Grain. And here they come. And what are they doing? They're bowing down to mm -hmm. Pharaoh's representative. Uh, I can't imagine what was going through his mind. Now here, here's one of the things I think of uh, the patriarchs of the scriptures. Uh, Adam uh, on. These guys were geniuses. Especially Adam. I, I doubt <coughs> if there has ever been a more intelligent person on the face of the earth than Adam. He was perfectly created and named all the animals. So these, uh, the further we get away from creation, I believe the less uh, character and intelligence we have. So this aha moment that he had, um, and I, I, I checked out, you know, is that a slang word? It's actually a psychological word. And it's derived some German professor. He was a uh, theoretical physicist. I don't know what that means, but it sounds smart. <laughs> <laughs> but it basically, and had this has ever happened, a thought just comes to mind. A memory just comes, you know, where did that, where did that come from? How, how did it get here? And that moment, that Joseph had, he re here, here are these, his brothers, he recognizes them. And the first thing that comes to mind, my dream. This is my dream. This, this is the meaning of my dream. So, uh, my dream. Anyways, I just thought that was quite interesting. It's, it's interesting to think that um, his brothers had no qualms about going back to Egypt after they sold their brother into a right. caravan. I don't know if I don't know if they knew where he was going. They sold the Amalekites, right? Ishmaelites. Ishmaelites. Yeah. So, yeah. other side, uh, Iran, Iraq, <laughs> Ishmaelites. But, but they would have never have pictured him being in that kind of position of prominence well, after being sold into slavery. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. It, exactly. Yeah, we we don't know where he. The Bible doesn't indicate that they were going to Egypt, does it? To the brothers. Recall. Yeah, I mean, they, yeah. Anyway, they, they yeah. sold them. Yeah. He ends up in Egypt. It's like it's like going on a vacation, you know, the yeah. Cancun. It might have, they might have been on a I, don't know, I get dig into it a little bit more. They might have been on a trade route to Egypt. Yeah, that might have been a common journey. But, but even even if they knew he was probably going to be a slave in Egypt. They would never have dreamed right. that he yeah. was going to be yeah. where he was. So they were not expecting to see yeah. their brother, so they didn't recognize him. How many times have you been out and someone spoke to you and called you by name and you're looking at him and say, thinking, I know I know you, but where do I know you from? And it's because they're not dressed in the uniform or the or yeah, a familiar setting. Yeah. 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 That's right. Well, also, Joseph was shaved when he went to Egypt. Right. Yeah. You know, that, that, if you shave a man's beard, it, he looks completely different. Looks. Yeah. Yes. Shave. I'm going to see if I can recognize him next week. <laughs> what are you saying? Shave. I'm going to see if I can recognize him next week. Shave. Shave. But you know, every one of us it happened because I remember a time that we stopped while we was coming back from the hospital. And me and her stopped at the Dairy Queen, and I walked right by my brother I haven't seen for a long time, and she was the one that says, isn't that your niece sitting over there? Yeah. And I turned around and looked, and it was my niece. Yeah. I didn't even wreck my own brother, because I hadn't seen him so long. Yeah. So that happens. Yeah. Well, and that's one time Sherry cut her hair when we were first married, and I came home to know who she was. <laughs> That's how it's all the time. Here's our confidence. I said, that better be a wig. <laughs> I swear it did. Let me get you out of this one. <laughs> Number four. 
Yeah. What was the purpose of Joseph's accusation? No, my lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all the, the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. Your servant were twelve brothers, the sons of one son of one, one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and no one and one is no more. <laughs> Joseph really unnerved his brothers at this point, and, and he actually got information from these accusations. He found out that there was twelve brothers. He found out that Benjamin was with his father. He found out his father was still alive. Um, and, and if he had revealed himself, he, he, he wouldn't have gotten some of this information. He puts his brothers into prison, which was actually, if you look at the law of the day, the Lux Polonius, that would have been, that would have been equitable because his brother sold him into slavery. So for him to put him in prison, that would have been certainly an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. What, what's the term you just used? Lex Thelonious. Never heard that. Yeah. So it means basically an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That was their, their law of the day. Dang, brother. <laughs> <laughs> How say it? Lex Thelonious. I got to remember that. Yeah. I like that. It sounds, sounds impressive. Excellent. It, sounds, it sounds Italian, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Hey, yeah. I'm going to go to Italy and use that. Go ahead. I'll, I'll probably end up in jail. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, when you confront someone in sin, it's, it's, it's difficult. You know, if you're a parent and you've got to discipline your child, it's hard. Or as, you know, as someone in... Um, an elder that <clears throat> chose that's task with confronting a, a church member engaged in unrepentant sin, that's tough. You know, whatever situation you might find yourself in, it's hard to speak the truth in love when hard truths must be told. But God often uses our confronting of others to lead them to repentance as he was using Joseph to confront his brothers. So we should not be afraid to confront sinners, but always do it with compassion and hope that it produces true repentance. Psalm 105, 16 through 19 says, When he summoned a famine on the land, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron. Until what he had said came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. So David here is talking about the famine that had come upon the land. And, and it was no accident that Joseph was there. You know, God had called the famine and he destroyed it provisions of, of the grains, but he sent a man ahead of them, and David understood the injustice and misfortune which came upon Joseph, but he knew that the plan which was from God was to save Egypt and to save the patriarchs and the whole region from famine. Even though Joseph's pain and his slavery was real, it couldn't cancel the plans of God, and his season of affliction, affliction was for a time when the plans of the Lord tested him. And when we first meet Joseph, he's this tender, young, yielding lad with all these great dreams. And he has no, no conspicuous power at this point. But now when we see him, he emerges from his captivity well qualified to take the helm of Egypt in, in the position he's in as second in command. Spurgeon says the iron fetters were preparing him to wear chains of gold and making his feet ready to stand on high places. It's even so with, with all the Lord's afflicted ones. They too shall one day step from their prisons to their thrones. <clears throat> Joseph was brought low, but in God's time he was lifted up. He was given authority over all the possessions of the house and had authority over princes and elders in his position. Uh, let me transition through for point number five. <clears throat> we are honest men, he said, his brother said to him. <laughs> and he's thinking, really? <laughs> Today, in, in Psalm, when David's reminiscing about this time, when he's teaching on it, I believe accurately, when he speaks of Joseph, you know, we know that he was in prison. David said his feet were in fetters and he had an iron ring around his neck. Yeah. Uh, 
until it came to pass that what? His words were tested. Until it came to pass, the prophetic words of Joseph were tested. Now we go to point number five. What was Joseph's testing? Joseph said to them, is it just, it is just as I told you, you are spies. And this is how you will be tested. Send one of your numbers, the, of your brothers back. Do this and you will live. For I fear God. If you're on, if, uh, answer that question. If you are honest men, as you just said, bring your youngest brother to me. Uh, I believe it. When reading this in the Psalms and reading what is spoken of Joseph, that Joseph was being tested himself by God. I mean, he was a deliverer, uh, a Christ like deliverer. And whether what he was saying was true, and then himself, here he is, being tested, and now he's testing his brothers. And this, um, let, let me read Psalm 66, 9 through 12, and then I'll make this statement. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You have brought us out to a place of abundance. If you're walking with the Lord any amount of time, or if you're in life, you're going to be tested. And here's a question that, that I've thought about a lot. What is the purpose of testing? Let's go to school. When, when you're in high school and you're taking a test, what's the purpose of that test? Is it for the teacher to know what you know? Or is it for you to know what you know? As a, as a child, it was, I just wanted to pass the test. I want the teacher to know I can pass it. I don't care how I pass it. I'm going to pass it. But the reality of testing is for the student to know. And what I've learned, if we really want to know when the student is ready, the teacher will come. And all of a sudden, here's these boys, these uh, ten, 10 brothers. They're students. They're, they're seeking answers. They're seeking help. And where did they find it? They, they find it in Joseph. Uh, we're honest men. Um, Joseph was tested until the time of testing was fulfilled in, in, in the Psalms. So uh, you just see that I, I can't recall the scripture, but I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, I'm sure. Uh, Nikolai, I'm sure it'll come to your mind. Uh, do not despise the testing of the Lord. I, I might be not using proper. Are you talk about discipline. Yeah. Are you talking about discipline? Do not despise discipline. Yeah. What well, could we say the testing and discipline may be simultaneous? Yeah. Maybe synonymous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't despise it. The testing. Testing the tri trials of, of the Lord. So here, uh, <coughs> I just think that fits so beautifully from, from point four to five. Mm -hmm. uh, we're honest men. <laughs> and Joseph's probably thinking, you know, I had to prove my honesty too, that what I'm telling the book butcher and the baker, or the yeah. uh, wine that cup bearer and baker was true until his testing was true. Now it's a testing of his brothers. Uh, and and just, just came to mind. Okay, I'm keeping one of your brothers. You guys go back to see if you come back for him, or are you going to leave him like you left me? Mm -hmm. It's a real test. Mm -hmm. Hey, Tony, do you think that when Joseph was thinking here, he was might have been thinking, I can get even with my brothers now? I hope not. <laughs> you and me, yeah, that would have been our That's thing. what I was yeah. just sitting there thinking. Well, as my mom would say, 
They got their comeuppance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, you know, think about which brother that Joseph took. Joseph took Simeon, who's already, like, caused his family a lot of trouble because, you know, they went and slaughtered that whole town of people. You know, think about, did he get his comeuppance? Is that a part of his comeuppance? That he was the one that was, like, why did Joseph select that brother? Yeah, he, he was uh, the brothers that, that did the attacking of uh, Jacobites. Yeah, they were from. They were the first born of the concubine. The, the first concubine who was that remember. Uh, they were. They, he was one of the older brothers, right? I was just, you know, because Reuben was the first born. You know, if you want to take a, a prisoner in that time. Yeah. But Reuben tried to save him. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. We'll find out someday. <laughs> yeah. But it's, I, I love that. I love that thing. Yeah. Okay. Point number six. What prompted their guilt? They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. Joseph's brothers were a little late to recognize their guilt for selling Joseph into slavery. He probably felt their guilt along the way in various degrees, but it wasn't until they actually felt threatened by receiving the consequences that they admitted it. The guilt had separated them from God, their brother Joseph, and even their father. And for 20 years, this guilt for their brother's supposed death had, had really eaten into them. Probably not a week went, and this is some speculation, probably not a week went by without one of them being tormented of what they had done. Yet they couldn't tell anybody. When everything starts to go wrong, this is the first thing that comes to their minds. And Joseph's actions were necessary to offer the blessings. If he had dealt with his brothers more openly, he would not have tested their trustworthiness in this matter. And, and his strategy actually bore fruit. They spoke of Joseph again as their brother, and he learned that Reuben was against the initial plan. And this had been haunting their souls in, in, in this distress that came rightly from their action. But when you think about it, you know, these guys were, they had done some pretty bad things, um, the brothers, when, when, um, and, and God could have used, could have used anybody. Could have raised up, could have raised up new patriarchs, and got rid of these these brothers if He wanted to. That, that was His choice, but it wasn't. Um, they really needed an awakening of their consciousness right now, because of what they had done. And this certainly brought it brought it to bear when they went through this situation. Psalm 103, verses 2 through 4 says, Iniquity brings, oh, sorry. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Iniquity brings conviction and judgment. And Paul here describes a self indulged person as dead even while he lives. David saw that. The sinful act of adultery is something that was desirable at first, but later this iniquity gnawed away at him until he received his forgiveness. And, and when Nathan came and told him about the stolen lamb, it really brought it to bear upon, upon him when he realized that, that that man was he that was talking to Nathan was talking about. I'm going to imagine this is Reuben speaking. I, I, don't, I didn't look in context, but we saw how distressed he was, and he pleaded with us for his life, but we wouldn't listen. Oof. What's the timeline there from the time they left him until now? 12 years? Well, he was, uh, I have it. But, um, 1898, he was sold into to the Ishmaelites. 
and 1875, so it was 17, and we're talking Third. another 28? 28 years. No, 28 years old. Oh, okay, so 17 to 28. So 11 years. So I think it's just another case of God's mercy on the brothers. Who, yeah, that, like you said, Reuben, he, he's just dealt with his guilt every moment of his life. Yeah. He remembers yeah. leaving his brother. Yeah. Among, among all the other well, that, things entwined in this scripture, I think one that stands out for me is God, here, you know, God's mercy. What I think he would have seen his, his father dealing with you know, the yeah. loss of Joseph all this time. Mm -hmm that Joseph was, you know, his chosen son that oh, he loved yeah. so much. And then he, no, Jacob the wouldn't have been the same right, without no, the Joseph, yeah. you know, and, and he knew, as they all did, right. what truly had happened to Joseph. And they were trying mm -hmm. to live this lot. Uh, Psalm 103, he forgives all your iniquity. Um, I don't, boy, I have to believe Joseph being an antitype of Christ, his purpose was to bring his brothers to repentance. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, good, good. Also, Bob, yes. the scripture that you referenced um, in Psalm uh, 105, uh, somehow, initially, you, I envisioned them in a dungeon, but just sort of around talking. Yeah. with the bread maker and the cup bearer. And yet, I never thought, you know, his feet were hurt with feathers and his neck was put in a collar of iron. So for years, he's down there with a collar of iron. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that put a new perspective on what my vision mm -hmm. of the dungeon was, you know, the jail. Yeah. Horrible, can't imagine. Yeah. Uh, point number seven, because we have to hurry up on we're going to have cake. <laughs> That's right. Have you ever used the term, I told you so? Uh, anybody else enjoy it as much as me? <laughs> I, think I, might have heard that voice. I think if you're a parent, um, if you're a parent, yeah, you've said it at least once. Or a husband. Uh, Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. I think this indicates to me that Reuben thought he was dead. Reuben thought Joseph was dead. And we're, we're getting our comeuppance because we killed our brother. And now it's coming back on us. Uh, behold, you delight in the truth. And this is speaking of God. Psalm 56. Behold, Lord, you delight in the truth and the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret, in the secret heart, in, my, in that secret place of who I am. As we as we're studying this, what I'm seeing is the whole purpose of all of this. If I could put it in one word, it would be repentance. God to bring his people to repentance. His, these are his chosen people. The, you know, the, the pillars of heaven are built on these guys. Uh, and he never forsake, never forsook them, even though they had forsaken their own brother. Uh, and now uh, he's bringing it all about. And uh, with Reuben, I don't think this was blame. I think it was maybe pleading. God, didn't I tell you? Anyway. All right, point number eight. Was Joseph showing mercy or, or revenge? They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them again and began to weep, but then he came back and spoke to them again. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver in his sack. At the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened the stack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his silver in the mouth of his sack. My silver has been returned, he said to his brother. Here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank, and they turned to each other trembling and said, 
what is this that God has done to us? I think, this is me, I think that Joseph was showing mercy to his brothers. Um, that the tears that he, that he cried in, 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 as he thought about the strategy, what he was putting his brothers through, I think that reveals to us that it was mercy. And he, he bound his brother uh, Simeon. And, and I think it was a check to see if the brothers would take the money and run or if they would actually come back for Simeon because they could have easily done that. You know, they had the grain, they had their money back. Would they care enough to come back for their other brother? They've already rejected Joseph, left him behind. Mm -hmm. And I think Joseph shows a, a, a powerful, redemptive way of responding to that hurt that he that he had when every fiber of his being would have been crying out for revenge. I mean, let's let's face it, it was one of us and something, you know, our brothers had done that to us. It would be hard not to want to seek revenge for that. Um, this is the essence of the Christ, Christian gospel of reconciliation. And Paul said it really well in, in Romans 12, 9 through 17. He said, let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of saints. Extend hospitalities to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. Well, that just, to me, really speaks to... Um, mm -hmm. You know our our instructions. Um, Psalm twenty five six and seven says, "Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they've been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions, according to your steadfast love. Remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord." And it's you know it, it, in the in the song of redemption uh, that Moses. Uh, referred to um, both God's mercy and love and, he, and after they had crossed the Red Sea and he said you've led in your steadfast love with people who you've redeemed and, and God does show mercy and love to us and thankfully because we've all got a past we've all made mistakes uh, even David whose heart was after the Lord's made some bad choices and bad mistakes and God cleansed him from his iniquities you know, it kind of haunts me. I think I would have, hopefully not, but I think I would have been seeking revenge. Yeah. Boy, forgive me. But I don't, I don't know that. It's your brothers. It's your brothers. Your brothers uh, my brothers, they torture you. Exactly. They torture you. My, my brother did one time. They threw me in a separate thing for three hours. <laughs> I know, but you love them. They were your brothers. He must have just read this story. I was just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. They hanged me in a tree one time for a half a day. Absolutely. <laughs> they put me in a drum of a dryer cool. and rolled me over a hill. <laughs> <laughs> and if it wasn't for my brother Joe, he made me marry her. <laughs> <laughs> one, one last thing. When we think about this story... You know, Paul um, said something earlier about God brought the famine, God brought Joseph. There. When we look at the story as a as a small as a small section of it, we miss out the bigger picture because God brought His people out of Canaan into Egypt, so that way they would be corrupted by the same corruption that affected Canaan. Mm -hmm. And then we when we see that that major work of mercy, when we when we look at the micro, smaller scale of it, mm -hmm. we see more and more how. The individual parts of the story, God is redeeming mm -hmm. His people, not just on a small scale, but on a whole large scale. Right. And the big, and the big picture is then, then from Egypt to the Back Promised Land, you know, through Moses. Yeah. I'd like to close with a poem. Rex is a friend of mine. 
been around a very long time. He remains young at heart. His opinions are tart. His influence remains weighty. But what the heck? Today he's 80. Oh, 85. 85. 85. 85. 85. Doesn't, 85 doesn't mind. <laughs> and you ought to thank me, Rex. I just gave you five extra years. 